Why Explore Space? Curing Climate Change with Alan Gratz. Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. This week we kick off a new series, Why Explore Space? To discuss how space travel and exploration are essential to help monitor and cure the effects of global climate change. Later in the show, we're going to be talking with Alan Gratz. His new book, Two Degrees, is a young novel, a young adult novel exploring the effects of catastrophic climate change around the world. Now, since the earliest days of the human race, people have been attempting to predict the weather with varying results. Uh, such prognostications were essential for planting, hunting, and other reasons. Now, the realization that climate is vital to understanding weather took quite a while for scientists to understand. And the climates of Earth have changed over time and will continue to change in the future. Now, from the time of the ancient Greeks, people have discussed the idea that human actions could change environmental conditions on Earth. And by the 19th century, researchers had started to realize for the first time that human activities, notably the consumption of fossil fuels, had started to alter the atmosphere of Earth, adding to the CO2 which naturally envelopes our planet. Now, at that time, before the advent of air or space travel, the only measurements which could be taken were from ground and water. The first hints humans had started to alter the natural paths of global heating and cooling were greeted with curiosity more than alarm, and nothing was done to correct the issue early on. Surprise, surprise. Now, Earth is warmed by our sun as sunlight strikes the surface of the Earth. Some of this energy is reflected back towards space and a portion of this energy is absorbed by the atmosphere. In order for temperatures on Earth to remain stable, these input and output levels need to be equal. One might imagine this like trying to moderate temperatures in a greenhouse by opening a door just the right amount. Now, Eunice Newton Foote, a 19th century amateur scientist, noted that as glass cylinders are exposed to sunlight, temperatures within them rise. Now, when the humidity inside cylinders is increased, temperatures rise even more. Now, switch out that water for carbon dioxide and the temperature rise was even greater. Now, in addition to being a scientist, Eunice Newton Foote was also a feminist and abolitionist uh, who was friends with the American suffragist Elizabeth Cady Stanton. So, she was a troublemaker from the beginning. During the 1930s, British engineer Guy Stewart Callender first took note of rising temperatures centered around North America and the North Atlantic since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. From the 19th century through the 1930s, carbon dioxide levels and temperatures continued to rise. Um, through the 1940s, human created aerosol pollutants in the atmosphere began to build up, reflecting sunlight back to space, temporarily lowering temperatures over large portions of the globe. By the 1970s, researchers recognized this cooling trend, driving popular notions of a coming ice age. <laughs> However, this cooling was the result of aerosols, which only last a few years or so in the atmosphere. Soon enough, carbon dioxide, which can remain in the atmosphere for centuries, took over once more and temperatures again began to climb. Today, climate, ch climate change nears a tipping point where we face the real pops possibility of frequent widespread catastrophic weather events. 
Next up, we talk with young adult novel author Alan Gratz. His new book from Scholastic Press, Two Degrees, tells the story of a desperate, uh, desperate uh, group of young people from around the world caught up in the effects of catastrophic climate change. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we are delighted to be joined by Alan Gratz. He is a New York Times bestselling author, and his new book, Two Degrees, is... Uh, <laughs> we both got just, it. We both got it. Imagine that. We must know the same person. <laughs> <laughs> books just hit uh, number one on uh, children's environment books on uh, Amazon, and, congr and congrats on that, Alan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm I'm excited to be here. Um, I love science podcasts. Uh, I'm uh, uh, and uh, um, I, I'm thrilled to be here on one. I'm I'm not a scientist, so I never thought I'd be on a science podcast. But uh, but now that I've written a book about climate change, I guess I'm I'm a I'm an amateur scientist. That's great. That's great. Science science welcomes all. <laughs> yeah and actually you know it's one of the things i've learned is that you know you don't need a phd in astrophysics to make a real contribution to science you know i i think they're absolutely right and, and it's one of the things i try to tell kids is that uh, just you know doing something just getting involved just learning learning science and talking to people about about science you're a right. scientist absolutely kids are natural born scientists totally so, so uh, just tell us a little bit about your book, Two Degrees, and um, give us an intro to that, if you would. Please. Sure. Yeah, so Two Degrees. Okay, so this is a story of four different kids in three different parts of North America who are all going through, at the same time, really, all going through climate-related disasters. So we've got a girl in California who is trying to escape a megafire with her horse. We've got uh, two boys in Churchill, Manitoba, who are trying to escape uh, a polar bear who's come in off the uh, the sea ice because there's no sea ice to be out on. So he's out in on the land and, and pursuing them for his, for his dinner. Uh, and um, I've got a girl in Miami, Florida, who's trying to survive a Category 5 hurricane uh, with her neighbor's dog and uh, trying to... Uh, um, trying to get to safety. And I weave all three of those stories together. So you get a little chunk of each of the stories all the way through. And then in the end, you find out that they are all connected in ways that um, surprise the characters and hopefully will surprise young readers and and um, maybe just possibly change their world. Wow. And what inspired you to write it? So I've written about other big stuff. Um, I've written about big events, like I wrote a book about D-Day. I've written about the Battle of Okinawa for two war-related ones. I've written about the refugee crisis in the world. I've, I've written a book about 9-11. And as I did more and more of these books and more kids were picking them up and reading them, I would get letters and they would say, oh, will you write about this? Will you write about this? And the 9-11 book I wrote, Ground Zero, was a direct result of kids saying, we, we want to read about 9-11. And I was like, why? It happened during my lifetime. And then I realized it didn't happen during their lifetimes. I write for middle schoolers, right? And this is ancient history to them. So then I wrote that book and now they're like, well, now how about a book about climate change? And I was like, oh my gosh, you're kidding, right? I mean, that's a huge topic. I don't know. I don't even know where to start, but right. I had so many kids who were 
wondering, wanting to to understand this, uh, but also read a compelling story about it. So I jumped in. I uh, I took the plunge, and um, boy, it was a it was a lot. <laughs> it was a lot to 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 research and to write. But uh, but I'm really proud of Two Degrees, and I hope that it becomes that for kids. I hope it becomes a resource for them to understand really what climate change is and and what we can do about reversing it. Hmm. And so how this leads right into how does how do works of fiction like this help kids explore science and learn more about our planet and the universe around us? Yeah, so I mean we've got a ton of great nonfiction titles for kids and those are amazing and I recommend all those uh, those all the time. I had a couple of good ones stacked up here a, a, a while back. I could have shown off, um, but uh, like "Save the People" by Stacy McAnulty, uh, "How to Change Everything" uh, by Naomi Klein, or book mm-hmm. for kids Great one. that yeah. are about yeah, they're about changing the world and 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 about climate change specifically. Both of those books, um, but but we also need, I think, fiction that is compelling, something that is a page turner that entertains kids. I I used to be an eighth grade English teacher, mm-hmm. and I know what a challenge it is to get kids to sit still and to learn something. And sometimes their natural curiosity and their uh, will make them go down the rabbit hole and learn everything about something. But oftentimes you kind of, you have to make the- Some of us still do that. (laughs) What's that? Oh yeah, so still yeah. do that. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I, there are so many afternoons I've lost where I go down a rabbit hole researching or reading something and I'm like, where did that afternoon go, right? <laughs> yeah. So um, so kids can do that too, but but I think a lot of times they also need something that's entertaining, that's going to to couch. I, I don't know. I, I I publish with a with my publishers called Scholastic, and I like right. the kid that I put the Scholastic back in Scholastic. Um, that, that, that I that I that I that I try to make things kind of subversively educational. Page Turner first, and then and then educational second. Oh my God, I I don't know how to tell you, Alan, but I just may have to steal. Was it sub subversively subversively educational? <laughs> That's, my, that's always that. my mission. I want yeah. you to learn something, but don't know that you're learning. Don't don't feel like you're learning it. I don't know if you know this or not, but uh, some of the first board games ever developed were developed, you know, with a you know a mission for kids to learn Christianity or to learn you oh, know wow. some you know moral lesson, you know. Yeah. And so they were not particularly um popular right right you know? because they were so educational right like they and, you could you could tell they were trying to get right. you to learn something right 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 but i but uh, of course you know and i'm blanking on her name right now but there was a woman who developed what was the first version of what we now call monopoly but it was called the landlord's game <laughs> right, because it was not about capitalism. It was about it was anti-capitalist. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly right. And of course, you know, she was rejected. Of course. You know. And now, of course, we play it as like the American game of acquisition. You know, squeeze <laughs> out your enemies. I know. Um, that that board game drives me nuts. I I love board games, and my family and I are big uh, board game players. And anytime somebody brings out Monopoly, I'm like, no, I'm out. No, this game just, <laughs> this will drag on forever. And it's just about squeezing each other. No, uh, talking about one, though, that subversively educational. Right. Uh, Wingspan. Have you heard of this board game? No, I have not. No, I have not. So there's a, there's a contemporary board game called Wingspan. And uh-huh. it has a great game dynamic. It's a fun game to play. But the backbone of it is that you get individual cards with birds on them and Audubon like illustrations of the birds. And it has facts about each of the birds that you collect. And so it, and it's all scientifically accurate. And, you know, you end up laying eggs on the birds and the birds who can hold the most eggs are the ones who lay the most eggs in their nests. And some of them have different kinds of nests that they build. And some of them don't have nests at all and use other birds nests. It's really I've learned so much about birds by playing this game and I just play it. I play the game because it's fun and that's the trick, right? Right. And I think there's so much to be gained for both kids and adults from this subversively educational way of, you know, teaching in a way that, 
people enjoy. You know, right. they're doing it for the enjoyment. Like kids don't go to the gym every, for the most part, don't go to the gym every couple of weeks. So why do most of them stay so fit and healthy? Because they're playing. They're out there playing. Right. Yeah. And that play is their exercise. That's their workout. And to yep. me, it is so important to develop these means of people enjoying themselves that just happens to have the side effect of being subversively Subversively educational. Right. right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. I, you I, know, go ahead. there are studies too that say that that um kids, you know, most kids draw. They love to draw with yes. crayons, they love to draw, yeah. you know, with anything yeah. you give them. Yeah. And then there's a certain age where many kids stop drawing. They just stop because they start to critically evaluate what they're doing and it's not for fun anymore. Right. When when you're a kid and you're drawing for fun, it doesn't matter if your house looks like a real house or the dog looks like a real dog. Right. But there's a certain point where you start to start to evaluate it critically and hold it up against real art. And you realize, oh, I I can't draw a dog to look like a dog, so I'm not going to draw at all. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And and educators talk a lot about how when we lose that sense of play we lose that we lose different creative parts of ourselves as well a lot of people stop being creative because they feel like it's not play anymore it, it has to be competitive or it has to be evaluated or right. quality you know it, right. qualitative. it has to meet someone um, else's mark right exactly someone exactly. else's expectations right yeah wow it's incredible so um i was gonna say just another little sidelight and doing something similar right now building uh space environments within second life which is a 3d oh, yes yeah the, the video game yeah yeah and uh like for uh next weekend uh for halloween weekend everyone who's missed this by two weeks um <laughs> <laughs> i'm building uh, a haunted lunar base oh nice so, you know, people can go around and have fun, but also learn about the moon, space exploration. And I've also heard that in, in a massively multi, uh, multiplayer online games, role-playing games, like um, like World of Warcraft, that sort of right. thing, that economists look at the in-game economies of mm. different items to see how economy, to see, to, to be able to test drive different economic policies that won't really wreck like a nation's economy, right? right like they right. can try it out in the video game where people are responding in human ways. It's not a computer simulation. It's it's human beings responding yes. in a simulated world, right? Right, right. And um, there are also, I, I, I thought I read too, that some, some uh, scientists were looking at the spread of disease uh, through online, like multiplayer things where they could tag, uh, tag an item with... Um, you know, a like a virus, disease. right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, and right. so, and see how quickly it passes among a community through contact. I, I think stuff like that is really astounding. I love, I love that that we can learn from things right, that too. we're also doing for fun. It's amazing. So, um, so I love the characters in this book. You have oh, four thanks. main characters: Akira, Owen, George, and Natalie. What or can we dare say who inspired? <laughs> who inspired them or what so is you know i never i've never put myself or anybody that i know exactly into a book yeah. um except for once i did write a book about the holocaust and i and i um i knew a holocaust survivor jack gruner and it was his story that i told and it's pretty obvious i say that in the book and he's a co-author on the front but everybody else all the other characters i create are fictional i i i will read about the what happens to different people in these situations like the Akira story is based on a couple of different major wildfires uh, that have happened in California in the last five years. But then I fictionalize it. I create my own fictional wildfire and then my own fictional character in, and drop her into the middle of it. But even though the characters are fictional, everything that happens to them is something that happened to a real person in oh, one of these real situations, right? Really so I, I, because I never, my, my work is fiction, but when I'm, especially when I'm writing about something like climate change, I don't want somebody to come to me and say, well, you made that up. Like, that's not a mm -hmm. thing that really happens. Right, and right. I want to make sure I can point back to all the things that the kids go through and say, those things really happened. So in terms of inspiration, like Akira, 
is 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 based on a number of different people who survived mega fires and um and lived to tell the tale in in churchill manitoba owen and george themselves aren't based on anybody in particular but their experiences are um there was a girl who uh, a young woman who lived in churchill and was attacked on the streets of churchill by a polar bear on halloween night in 2013 yeah, hey, look just at that walking person home dressed from... up as a polar bear. Wow, that's really right. realistic. Wow, I know, right? <laughs> and she wasn't dressed up as a polar bear, so it wasn't a mistaken identity on on the polar bear's part. The polar bear thought dinner time and caught her on the way home from God, a Halloween party. I never heard and that story. She lived. She, but right, she got, uh, she got part of her skull got torn up and a part of her right. ear. Um, wow. So, like polar bear attacks are happening Hard. more and more. Yeah. yeah. So those are all based on real events, and then. For, for Natalie's story, um, I used experiences from people who were in Hurricane Sandy in New York City. Oh, yeah, yeah, I used yeah. experiences from people who um, had been in Katrina and, of course, all the different hurricanes that have hit South Florida. Um, you know, no, but there's there hasn't been the big one that's hit Miami, not since 1926. Right. So I had to imagine what that would be like. But I used hurricanes that have hit other big cities as my models. Wow, that's pretty cool. And finally, what's what's next for you? What's the next project on your oh. board? <laughs> so I, I got two things to tell you about. Number one yeah. is something that's finished and it comes out in January. I'm very excited about it. I have a preview of it. Ooh. It's Captain America, the Ghost Army. So I, I got to write a graphic novel that's with Marvel and Scholastic oh. that's about Captain America and Bucky Barnes' sidekick fighting Nazis in World War II. That's I'm super hard. stoked about this. It's based on, so I always want like to put real history in my stuff. The U.S. Ghost Army, are you familiar with this? I've heard uh, the term. Army I unit? I've heard the term. I can't remember. Details. Sure. So yeah. during World War II, the United States Army pulled some stage magicians, some advertising right. copywriters, right. some yeah. music sound designers, some uh, and um, uh, some artists, some visual artists. And they put them into a unit called the Ghost Army, and they had a really cool insignia with a ghost, like casting electric, you know, like like mm -hmm. cat, like shooting electricity from it. But they they made these guys into a unit and said, "Your job is to trick the enemy." And right. so they would create fake airplanes and inflatable tanks and put them out mm -hmm. in fields so that spy planes would think we had more units in the field they would record the sounds of armies on the march and then drive through the forest with huge speakers on their trucks broadcasting it like blues brothers you know like right, right. <laughs> broadcasting like broadcasting the sounds of armies on the move they did fake radio transmissions to make the nazis think that we were landing in different spots they had fake dummies or they had dummies that were fake fake paratroopers that would fall from the sky to make them think we were invading on d-day we we dropped dummies in different places right. trying to make the nazis figure out where we were actually coming down so cap and bucky meet the actual u.s ghost army and then because it's a comic book they end up fighting um a, an a, a, a literal ghost army uh, of resurrected uh dead soldiers from the german side so <laughs> <Ghost! laughs> <laughs> right so i had a lot of fun uh putting some real his pulling some real history in from the u.s ghost army and of course some of the marvel fictional stuff so that's my next book it comes out in january of 2023 and then the book i'm working on for 2024 that would be another prose novel is about the attack on pearl harbor that's the next mm. big book for me hmm that's interesting well, thanks so much for being on the show, Alan. It was fabulous talking with you. It was great. I loved it. Yeah, let me tell you. Welcome back anytime. Oh, fantastic. Thanks. And that was Alan Gratz, New York Times bestselling author with his latest hit book, Two Degrees from Scholastic. Check it out. Today, we monitor the effects of climate change around the world from above our small blue marble. The first weather satellite, Tyrus-1, launched in 1960, providing our first real look at changing atmospheric, land, and oceanic conditions around the globe. Now, a wide range of satellites assist researchers in monitoring climatic conditions around our planet. The Aqua mission 
as you might suspect, collects information on oceans, precipitation, and snow and ice on land and sea. It's too bloody hot. Aura is equipped with four instruments measuring trace gases and aerosols in the atmosphere. CloudSat sees right through clouds, offering unprecedented studies of these structures, which play such a large role in shaping both weather and climate. The cream of the crop may be the Landsat series of satellites which have monitored the climate of Earth since 1972. Peace out. These are just a small fraction of the satellites utilized to study the climate of our planet, giving us a better understanding of how these processes work. Only through space exploration can we hope to mitigate the damage done by global climate change caused by human beings. In order to save Earth, we must travel into space. I sure hope you enjoyed this episode. We're gonna take a week or so off. It's my birthday after all. <laughs> and we're moving the show to Saturdays. The Cosmic Companion will be back on Saturday, the 26th of November, as we look forward to Cities in Space. We'll be talking with author Joe Yogurst. His new book, 100 Cities, 5,000 Ideas from National Geographic, explores cities around the world, and we're going to learn what that means for the future of cities in space. Please download, comment, share this episode anywhere you can imagine. How about a couple places you can't imagine? I can imagine that. I'd sure appreciate it. Clear skies.